Okay, and at this time, I have the pleasure of introducing Kelly Haynes. Kelly is our development manager where she manages member relations, grants, individual giving, and the volunteer program. Kelly has been working in the arts and culture and museum field for 10 years now, over 10 years. She's been a member of the Wheaton Arts team since 2009. Kelly received a BA in history from Rowan University and an MS and museum leadership from Drexel. After her experiences at the Museum of the American Revolution and the National Museum of Jewish History, Kelly joined our development team in 2018. She also served on the board of the Vineland Historical Society. Kelly, Kelly, I'm happy to turn the spotlight on you now. Great, Marcy, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. I want to send my sincere thanks to you all for your membership and your, for your support of Wheaton Arts. We're so, so lucky to have such a dedicated member base. And thank you for joining us today for this pilot program where we would like to take you behind the scenes of the Museum of American Glass. We wanted to give you an intimate first look at what our staff does and what they're planning for the future. And later on in the program, I'll talk a little bit more about other possible programs we'd like to offer and get your thoughts on those. And we would really love for this whole experience to be collaborative and conversational, so please feel free to use those question and answer and chat features. And as many of you know, we love to thank our members with benefits throughout the year. And remember, gift memberships are always available. So if you have someone in your life that might be interested in these virtual programs or any of the other benefits we offer, a gift membership is a great idea. And before we begin our program, we'd love to hear about everyone's connection to Wheaton Arts. So if you'd like to share when you first visited Wheaton Arts, you can do that in the chat box now. And while you're Answering that question, I'll kind of report on where everybody is from. So it looks like we have people kind of from all over, a lot of, you know, New Jersey, local South Jersey people, um, but I'm also seeing California, the Pocono Mountains, Virginia. This is great. This is great to have people from all over. Williamstown, Bridgeton, great, awesome. Great, and it looks like we have someone that came on a class trip as their first visit. Um, I know that was my first visit for me, I think probably when I was in middle school. Awesome, and some people have grown up around the area. 1981, my aunt and grandparents, that's awesome. Well, I'm gonna give you um, a little bit more time to answer that question. And while I do that, awesome. I'm going to, um, talk a little bit more about the ways that you can continue your support for Wheaton Arts. So you're already supporting us if you have a membership with us um, and other donations through our annual fund um, or other event opportunities are accepted throughout the year as well. And remember, your membership discount um, in the stores is 10%. And while we're closed to the public right now, you can still shop online. And when you make a purchase in our stores, you're not only supporting Wheaton Arts, but also the many artists, both on site and around the world, that have work in our stores. And it's a great time to shop this month. Um, starting on June 6th to the 21st, we'll have a free shipping promotion through our shopping cart. Um, and if you're a local resident, we have curbside pickup available on purchases too. And if you'd like any more information about the different ways you can support us, you can contact me. I'll have a slide at the end of the presentation with my email or our Director of Development, Rodi Barron, whose contact information is right here. And now I'm really pleased to introduce Kristen Qualls, who is our Director of Exhibitions and Collections, who's here with us today. And Kristen will be presenting on the Behind the Scenes program for you all. And again, as Marcy mentioned, please feel free to use that chat feature or the question and answer feature during the presentation. And a little bit of background about Kristen. Kristen manages the day-to-day -day staff, programs, and operations here at the Museum of American Glass. She was an integral part of the award-winning six-year exhibition titled Emanation. And prior to joining Wheaton, 
Kristen was the collections and exhibit specialist at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia. And among her other duties there, she led the development of new core exhibits on um, the electricity and amazing machine exhibits there. And Kristen received her MFA in museum exhibition planning and design from the University of the Arts and a BA in science, technology and society from Vassar College. Kristen, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm gonna to pass things over to you to get us started on the program. Great, thank you so much for um, helping to support and host this program, Kelly. And thank you to Marcy for your incredible um, technical support to make this possible. Um, I'm really excited to be able to share these exhibits that the museum um, and our whole staff have been working really hard on. And um, I'm really glad to have this platform um, to be able to share them with you. So thanks again, Kelly and Marcy, this is fantastic. Um, as they have both mentioned, uh, please do utilize that Q&A function that comes as part of the Zoom webinar. Um, as some of my museum friends and I have been talking about, um, you know, when we give tours and do programs, a lot of it has to do with interacting with the audience. Um, when you enter a gallery, what case do you move toward? Um, what object do we speak about that causes you to smile or uh, has a curious look on your face? And that's really sort of how um, I gauge how to give a tour. Um, and here, I can't see any of you, I'm sorry. So um, please again, do interact and Kelly's uh, gonna do a great job at sort of fielding those questions and so that I can answer them um, as we go along. So again, in the hopes of really wanna um, engage with you and make this more, as, as much of a, a conversation as we can um, through our new virtual realities here. Um, the Museum of American Glass, like I said, we've been working, um, the staff and I here have these two new exhibits that are coming up. Um, they will be celebrating Wheaton's 50th anniversary and really looking at the evolution of Wheaton Arts as a creative sanctuary. Um, we hope to get them open as soon as it is safe for visitors and staff to come back on site and um, we will be keeping them open through 2021, so there will be um, time for you to come see them. So it started 50 years ago as a Victorian-themed tourist attraction with a mission to preserve that South Jersey glass tradition has really evolved into a vital arts organization with this mission to explore creativity with our audiences and this amazing international community of artists. Um, so when thinking about this 50 year history and looking through our collections, I was really struck by the fact that there were certain themes that pulled out that really exemplified creativity. Um, the people, place, and process that combined um, really tell a story of the exploration of creativity specific to Wheaton Arts. So the exhibit will display artworks and artifacts that come from the collection here of the Museum of American Glass. Um, and it's through these tangible pieces that um, we're really hoping to convey the intangible qualities that make Wheaton Arts the creative sanctuary that it is. The people that allow creativity to flourish, the place that is steeped in this glass making tradition, and the process of balancing skill with vision. Now the Museum of American Glass is able to preserve that um, continuum and interpret the history of offhand glassmaking in South Jersey by supporting and engaging with the contemporary makers that work in our glass studio. We have a fellowship program that was formalized in 1983 and here you see two pieces from those fellows. On the left, Amy Roberts Chamberlain, Blue Sacrificial Bull, and on the right, James Harmon's Rap Series. Also key to our evolution are the Wheatons. The Wheaton family ensured that the name Wheaton came to equal glass. You can see here on the left is a piece by Stephen Paul Day that he made with old Wheaton apothecary bottles. He looked for images in the Museum of American Glass archives that you can see on the right, such as this portrait of T.C. Wheaton, who was the founder of the T.C. Wheaton Glass Company and grandfather of Frank H. Wheaton Jr., Wheaton Arts' founder. 
So by utilizing this imagery in the iconic Wheaton pharmacy bottles, Stephen Paul Day is again hearkening back to this incredible history and the people of Wheaton that give us the name. And Kristen, we had um, our first question. Um, oh, wow, asking, excellent. When did the contemporary art glass movement start? Well, since I'm representing the Museum of American Glass, I'm going to say 1962. Um, Europeans would probably argue with that, but here in the States, um, that's an iconic date because there was a workshop and in Toledo, Ohio, which is another huge glass town where Libby's from, and that workshop really aimed to take this infrastructure, these huge furnaces that were needed to, for this industrial um, glass making, and made them smaller and more efficient so that they could be used in the glass studio. So this workshop was teaching artists about how to use glass and how to use this equipment. Um, and again, that was 1962, so it wasn't long after that, um, by the early 70s, that there were departments and art schools that were able to, to teach glass and so took sort of that hand skill um, from the factories into the artist studio. Great, thank you. Now this piece, there's Frank H. Wheaton Jr., our founder. Coming up uh, is an image of Charles Pepper. This piece is by Lisa Cerny. She made it in 2001. Here you'll recognize that image of T.C. Wheaton. She again looks through our archives to find images of key people in glass from South Jersey. And here is M.L. Larson, a famous glass blower. And she used um, an etching process to commemorate these pieces through this vessel um, that you can see here. Now the story goes, Wheaton had a ghost. And artist Sibel Peretti came here in 1992 under a fellowship, and she wanted to capture that ghost for us so it wouldn't haunt us anymore. So you can see here, she's taken one of those Wheaton apothecary bottles, and she's captured the ghost. An old staff member who used to walk around with the paperweights held behind her back so they wouldn't knock together. You can see the figure inside the bottle is doing that, and she is etched on the finial of the apothecary bottle, a figure representing this ghost that is now captured. Another tie between Wheaton and Glass is that connection between the industry and the artistry that when we, Frank Wheaton founded us, he really wanted to make sure that, that those skills and that equipment from industry was available to artists. So here's an example of how that industry influenced an artist. On the left, you'll see a bottle, um, a larger bottle uh, made by Catherine Gray in 1992. Now that shape is known as a Prince Machiavelli, a well-known um, perfume who uh, used that um, iconography as the crown of the crown for their perfume bottles. They were made by Wheaton Industries. And on the right, you see an image of Bertha Brown Bailey um, painting the gold hand painting the gold onto those um, Prince Machiavelli bottles in the T.C. Wheaton Glass Company decorating department in 1925. Often in industry, the women had roles in the decorating department doing this type of detailed hand painting work. And Catherine Gray, as a fellow, was hearkening back to that as she painted her own Prince Machiavelli piece. Wheaton Arts is possible because of the broader community of people who help support the practices of these artists. So we had Wheaton that established glass in South Jersey and helped support the artists. And then we have collectors who've played a role as witnesses to the studio glass movement and have embraced the medium of glass as a fine art medium, as well as the artists that work with it. And uh, we have been lucky enough to have some of those collectors donate pieces to the museum so that we can preserve them and share with the public our shared passion for glass art. For example, here we have a William Morris piece, Suspended Artifact from 1995, that was generously donated by Peter and Jane Galetto, who have been incredible supporters of our glass studio. Paul Stankard, an incredible artist on his own right, 
also collects and has been able to donate pieces to the museum to ensure that we're representing all the studio glass movement. For example, this piece is by Dominic Labino. And as I had mentioned earlier, he was actually one of the ones that co-hosted that 1962 workshop with Harvey Littleton that introduced glass to the art world. So it was really important that we were able to have a piece that represented him. And it is wonderful that Paul was able to donate that to us. Kristen, if somebody had a piece um, in their own you know, collection or you know, something in, like in their home and they wanted to donate it to the museum, how could somebody go about doing that? Excellent question. Um, and you know, that's fantastic. Um, our collection is largely made up of donations. And um, the best way to do that, if you, if you have a piece or pieces in mind, would be to email me. Again, my contact information will be at the end of this presentation. Um, with all the information you know about the piece, the name of the artist, the title of the piece, the date it was made, um, how you came to acquire it, um, and a picture ideally. And that way uh, you can send that to me and me and my staff can assess it in comparison to our um, already existing collection of over 25,000 pieces um, and see if it fills any narrative holes for us and would be appropriate for our collection. If we feel it'd be great to have, we will present it to a board-based collections committee who make all the final um, decisions on whether or not uh, we want to expend the resources to uh, acquire something as museums are, um, you know, we, we preserve things in perpetuity. Um, so we want to make sure that we are managing our resources appropriately. Um, so if it is acquired, um, we can bring it into our collection and we have a deed of gift that transfers title and that also gives you a little bit of a tax write off um, as a small incentive to um, share your own passion uh, with of glass with us and the museum so that we can share it with the public. Uh, thank you very much. Good question, Kelly. Here we have pieces that were um, donated um, as part of the collection of Dr. Jerry Raphael. On the left, a Tom McLaughlin vase. He was actually um, Harvey Littleton's assistant, again, hearkening back to the um, early 1962 workshop. On the right, you see a goblet by Fritz Dreisbach. And in the middle, you see these three cylinders by Ricky Bernstein from 1978. These cylinders are a great example of, um, again, the skill of Ricky Bernstein, but also his fantastic sense of humor. Here are some pieces uh, gifted to us by Gail Wilson Britton. On the left, you see Thurman Statham's California from 1985. And on the right, Fritz Dreisbach's piece from the Mongo series. Now, both of these artists are using line incorporated into their work. Thurman uses line by drawing on the outside of flat pane glass, whereas Fritz has used glass itself to draw the line and encase it into a blown piece. Now key to the people that make Wheaton Arts what it is are the fairy artists that work here and have been in our studio from day one. The early glass blowers in the studio often came from industry and represent a link in the preservation of glass skills from the non-automated factory work to the studio glass movement. Early pieces reference traditional forms and patterning, as you can see here by these two pieces. On the left is a vase or a pitcher by Bill Valla, and on the right is a swan dish by Jean Crabtree. They were early glass blowers that worked in our studio in the 1970s. Kristen, we had another um, good question from the audience. Um, how do many of our artists and residents, if they have access to our collection, how engaged they are with the museum? Oh, absolutely. Um, the museum is, is here for all of our artists, whether they are fellows, visiting artists, or artists and residents. Um, we, do, we are public trust, so really our collection is owned by all of you and all of us. Um, so really anyone has access that needs it. But the artists do, when they come, get a tour so they know uh, what we have. So you can see we have a library um, full of amazing books about glass. We have an archive. Again, we have the collection and we're happy to make an appointment with any interested member of the public or um, artists from our studio who are interested. Um, sometimes they'll have an interest in a technique 
for example, and we can pull some pieces from the collection and let them look at them up close and personal. Um, and sometimes, as you've seen, they're interested in archival photographs. Um, and also, as they can tell you, I will uh, make a bother of myself <laughs> over in the studio. I'm watching what they're doing, and they've been so gracious in sharing uh, their creative energy with me and talking about their ideas and what they're working on. And often in that way, I can connect them with some pieces or some part of history that we have in the museum. So um, yes, we absolutely love that connection um, to work with the artists because um, they add so much. We learn as much uh, from them as they learn from us and it's a great, great way to um, share again our passion for this uh, medium of glass. Here you can see we have um, by Tony De Palma, who worked in our studio in the 80s. Um, this Devil's Fire, which is a traditional uh, South Jersey motif that he's incorporated into a contemporary perfume piece. And here we have a piece from Dom Friel, who's been in our studio since 1978 and has just recently retired. Um, so what you can see here is he's taken a traditional vessel and wrapped it with um, this marshscape, which references back to the marshscape painters of South Jersey, in particular Pat Witt, whose barn studio is actually right down the street from us. So here um, Don is incorporating that form of fine art um, into glass. Okay, we have one more question, Kristen, um, from the audience. Um, are there classes to learn about the art of glass blowing? Yes, absolutely. We do have classes. Um, uh, they, they have a range. Um, if you just want to dip your toe in and see just how hot that furnace actually is, you can do a make your own program. Um, they offer, they offer uh, paperweights, bowls. They usually have seasonal specials like Christmas ornaments or pumpkins. Um, so the best way to learn about that is to go to our website. Um, again, right now, unfortunately, we aren't offering that due to um, the social distancing mandates, but um, please keep an eye on our website to uh, know when we get back up and running and can offer that again. We also offer the occasional intensive glass blowing workshop that's over a weekend, um, which you'll get to work with Skitch Mannion, who's our um, technical director over in the studio, and um, get a little bit more in depth into, um, you know, gathering from the furnace, blowing a bubble up to making a, a simple vessel shape like a cup or a bowl. And then occasionally when we have the opportunity, we'll offer a longer workshop with um, a master glass blower who might be able to be um, in town for an event or coming through the area. Um, so again, that's uh, you know more depending on the schedules of um, the glass blowers in our studio, but please keep an eye out on um, our website um, so you can get an opportunity to get in the studio yourself. Wonderful, and thank you to Marcy. She's putting all of these links um, for classes for our 50th anniversary and how to support us in the chat box. Oh, great, thank you, Marcy. So with all these amazing people um, who have come together on Wheaton's um, campus, um, it's really interesting because you get um, not just the individual artists working, but them working together with the different fellows that come together who work with each other and our staff artists and visiting artists that might be around um, who are able to combine their skills and uh, vision to expand their creative practice learning from each other. So we have artworks that display um, this collaborative work. For example, here is a piece by David Hopper, Man Seated on a Paperweight made in 1986. And you can see he is literally seated on this paperweight, this flower paperweight here that was made by David Plaskett, who was um, in our flame working studio. We also have pieces that show, um, you know, uh, the way people can combine their strengths. We have Suzanne Horowitz and Lucartha Kohler creating the piece on the left with a great screen printed and gold leaf piece here. And we also have pieces that just show the sort of camaraderie that happens in our studio when you get a group of people working together. For example, on the right, 5 a.m. delirium from our 1995 group of fellows, Robin Campbell, Evan Snyderman, Dan Spitzer, and Panama Trailer. They were in the studio late at night fixing, you know, finishing up their work during their residency and um, came up with this whimsy 
that they created and wanted to give to the museum um, to commemorate again this camaraderie that they had developed working together in the studio. Kelly, are there any more questions? Um, no more questions right now. Excellent. I'll keep <laughs> moving. Okay. Um, in addition to the people that um, really uphold the creative, um, you know, exploration here, um, in using glass, there's it's, it, it's such a unique has such unique properties, and it makes it so dynamic a medium, and it poses a unique relationship between um, the hand and the tool. So when looking through our collection, I noticed that a lot of the pieces um, were made by artists who enjoyed residencies here that reference those hands and that tools and, and reflecting on the fact that these pieces are made by the hands of the artists using um, tools similar to those that glass blowers have been using in America for hundreds of years. So as you can see here are some pieces um, that very uh, specifically mention hands. We have Stephen Paul Day's Chief Seattle's Hand on the left. On the right, we have Kent Ibsen's Untitled piece. And the middle, this really interesting piece by Mayumi Miyake. She literally took sand and pressed it into her hand and made a pattern out of that that she poured the glass into. So that is literally glass being pressed by her hand. That's the imprint of her palm on that glass. So very um, representing very directly again, the, the artist's hand and the role it plays in creating these pieces. Again, glass is interesting because you can't touch it directly since it's so hot. So here we have some tools, Drew Smith's uh, 1992 piece where the glass rods are taking the place of the brush and a um, paintbrush, as well as Salmon Kalantri's um, Second Depression. Here's a detail of the piece where he's um, taken this really amazing Pat de Vere technique where you fuse glass together and recreated both um, shadows and uh, models of the shears that they use um, when working with the glass. Oh, Kristen, really quick before we move on, um, a question from the audience. What is the base of the paintbrush made from? Um, off the top of my head, I'm not 100% sure what it is, um, but I can get back, I can look it up in the records um, to make sure I have the right material and get back to the questioner. You can make a note of who it was. Thank you. Now, a great connection between hands and tools um, is the Millville Rose. Um, it was in the, this pattern um, was invented in Millville in 1905 um, by Ralph Barber, who was a glass blower at the Whitehall Tatum Company. And he was also a rose gardener and in his off hours, um, he created this special rose pattern. Um, he invented the tool, uh, the crimp, which you can see on the bottom of the photo that impresses this rose pattern into the paperweight. Now it used to be, this was a very secretive technique. Um, Tony De Palma, who I mentioned before, who worked here in the 80s, um, would literally lock the studio doors when he was making the weights so that people wouldn't see him. Um, nowadays, hopefully when uh, we reopen and you can come back in the studio, you'll be able to see um, people demonstrating making the rose to the public. So it kind of shows the way I'm sharing these tools and techniques um, have changed over the years, um, but you can still see that the Millville Rose, in spite of being in different patterns and um, forms, um, still represents a very specific style. And Kristen, kind of piggybacking off of that, um, for that specific style, if it's made somewhere else that's not in Millville, is it still called a Millville Rose? Yes, my understanding is that this specific style is a Millville rose no matter where it was made. So Millville has absolutely um, made an imprint on glass history. Great, thank you. It's an excellent segue into um, the place really being another important part of the evolution of Wheaton Arts. Um, South Jersey has such a deep history um, with glass and it can serve as a muse for our artists. As I mentioned before, um, they can see this history um, in the museum and can be inspired by the artfulness found throughout 
um, the range of American-made glass. Um, for example, here we had fellow Aaron Pexa create the Lucent Parlor. The clear piece on the left was made by him using a mold in our glass studio that was uh, made in 1890 in Jeanette, Pennsylvania. And on the right, you can see a white piece that is the Kempel piece that they use the mold to make uh, to mass produce in the around the 1950s. Um, so you can see um, Aaron's piece. Um, he didn't quite fill the mold. He kind of malformed it. So he's referencing this pressed piece that was handmade but mass produced. Um, so really showing the hand that's involved in creating these pieces. South Jersey was known for their bottles. We made a lot of bottles. For example, uh, the image on the left, you can see the historic bottle that was made by the Waddell Tatum Company um, here in Millville. And then just next to that bottle, the larger um, security bottle by David King. Um, David is an artist who references this very traditional um, glass form often in his work, again, sort of mediating against this idea of something that was almost seen as disposable, um, but putting it into a fine art form. On the right, you see images of candlesticks. We have Victoria Amadizada, um, who created the candlestick on the left. And you can see that she was directly influenced, um, came to their collection and looked at it um, by this candle holder, the blue one on the right that was made of Durand art glass here in Vineland in the 20s. Now we can't really talk about place without talking about the Wheaton Arts campus. Uh, Wheaton Arts was founded in the 1970s when bicentennial fever fueled an interest in historical recreation. As such, the museum lobby was designed to mimic the feeling of a Victorian hotel with the um, bold red flocked wallpaper you see imaged here, becoming a very memorable image of the institution. Um, it has also intrigued many artists that have come through that have directly referenced it in their work. For example, the picture on the right of Michael Crowder's Daguerreotype de Witton, uh, which he made in 2015. Um, I remember he um, worked very hard to find a flocking for the base that exactly matched the red in the flocking of that wallpaper. Here is another piece by Heather Sutherland in 2018. She's created a um, large scale lipstick um, out of glass and you can see that the patterning on the um, lipstick case looks like the patterning from the wallpaper um, and you can't really tell from the picture but I can tell you that it is flocked. Kristen I think it's so cool I mean as you mentioned you know it, the wallpaper being such a staple and then you know to kind of see artists take you know what's here and then you know make their own you know cr creative thing out of it. Um, could you speak just a little bit more to like the actual wallpaper if we know like where it came from the story behind that at all? I've been asking the question of where that wallpaper came from since I started working here. Um, it's an astonishing piece. Um, we don't know what, I don't know what company it came from. Um, I do know we have in our archives, we have um, the papers of the first director here who oversaw um, kind of the building of, of the institution and there is a folder in that contains um, a bunch of uh, wallpaper samples that they had gathered when um, determining how to decorate the museum. Um, so I can say that the wallpaper we ended up with might actually be the best choice out of the options we had and I can also say that it is, um, it comes direct from the 70s is really the best answer I have for you as to where it comes from. <laughs> Thank you. Great question. And uh, before we move off of the lipstick um, slide here, we did have a question um, from the audience of what is the size of that lipstick piece? Maybe about um, two and a half feet tall. Great. Thank but you. yes, it's, it's very, it's a She Hulk size lipstick, or maybe the statue of <laughs> lipstick. 
The other exhibit that the museum is hosting next year will focus on the 50th anniversary visiting artists. Um, these are artists who have uh, been part of Wheaton before. Um, resident artists have played a central role in our evolution, um, collectively defining Wheaton Arts as a creative sanctuary. Um, and so in celebration of that 50th, um, we wanted to invite them to come back and work in our studio. Unfortunately, uh, due to the COVID situation, we have had to shift that schedule a little bit and hope to be able to work with them next year um, so that you can come see them. But for now, we have pieces um, coming into the museum um, that they're loaning us to represent their current work um, that you will hopefully be able to see them um, working on while they're in our studio. So as you can see, we have a great array of artists coming in. Um, because the exhibit is still being installed, I don't have uh, full-scale installation shots for you yet. Um, but uh, so I did want to show you a little bit of a sneak peek here so you can get an idea of what you'd be seeing. Um, on the left here, we have a James Harmon piece. Um, you might remember that name. Uh, from the very beginning of this presentation, I showed you his um, Yellow Wrap series work. He was one of the first fellows in that first group in 1983, and he has remained um, a consistent um, partner with us, coming back often to work in the studio and help out and demonstrate. Um, he's been a great, great friend of Wheaton. Um, and this piece he made in 2014 called Money Piece. It's a cylinder on which he's applied bits of glass. And what's really interesting is that when this is still hot in the studio, he rolls it on a piece of watercolor paper. So in the installation, he will, will include those prints um, of this piece. And to your right, we have a Kate Rhodes piece, Sea Stone, which she made in 2019. It's part of her Hollow Marini series. So she pulls Hollow Marini and cuts them and then um, secures them together with wire to create these really magnificent organic forms. Now on the right here, you might uh, recognize this artist, um, none other than Paul Stankard. He actually was one of the artists that helped establish our fellowship program back in 1983. And he has been really working with us since we opened. And again, like Jim, he's still been um, a great friend to us throughout all of this time. Uh, this close-up is of his piece, Pollination, which he made in 2004. And you see these beautiful um, encased glass flowers. Now on the left, um, you can see these glass flowers that are part of a power figure um, from Vanessa German that she made during her emanation residency in 2017. Um, and I think um, given what's going on in the world today, it's really worth um, reading the full title out um, and giving it some thought. Love is still the greatest of who and what we are. For how the sky is a song in the shape of healing. For how not to die of sorrow. For how we need each other. I am reaching for your hand. Now what you have seen is a collection of artworks and artifacts that, um, again, we've worked hard to gather and spent a lot of time researching and pulling together um, an intellectual framework that can build a narrative on which these pieces can hang. Um, but that's only part of what goes into creating an exhibit. Um, the sort of industry uh, word on the street is it takes about 25% of the effort to do that sort of curatorial research and the other 75% of exhibit work is everything that has to happen so that that research can have a place um, to be displayed so that the audience, you guys, um, get to see it. Um, there's a lot of facilities work that goes into exhibit. I mean, it's a giant three-dimensional story. Um, so the facilities have to do all the repairs from the last exhibit, um, prep our cases and um, any specific needs we have for mounts for specific pieces so we can install them. Um, we have a lot of platforms and vitrines and, and stands that need to either be made or fixed and then painted to make sure they're um, the correct color for the current exhibit. Now I mentioned we do a lot of research in selecting the artifacts. Um, then once we know what we wanna look at, there's also a lot that has to go into pulling the artifacts. Um, uh, all of the museum staff are trained on how to handle these artifacts. Again, we have a glass collection that we are to keep in perpetuity. Um, 
So that's a, only, only a little intimidating. Um, so we do are very careful um, when we do handle these pieces and pull them out from storage in order to display them. We also, again, make use of these archives, not just for research, but also to share with the audience. Um, because these exhibits tend to run for nine months, um, we usually uh, scan the original piece and put a replica out. This is because light damage is cumulative. So um, every time you put a, a piece of organic material in the light, it's going to damage it a little bit and you can never reverse that damage. So that's why in museums, um, you often see paper either in a very dark room or not out for very long, or again, as we do here, um, a replica so that we can keep the original um, in good condition in these archival folders like you see here, um, but still be able to share the information with you. And Kristen, before we move on, I have a couple questions in the Q&A box. Um, our first one was um, in the museum, if the Victorian kitchen or dining room would ever make a return. Um, the Victorian kitchen and dining room will um, not be making a return. Um, that was a design conceit that was developed when we first opened in the 70s when there was still a living history of uh, the Victorian era um, so that people would come and they could say, oh, I remember my grandparents' kitchen looked like that and share with their um, you know, kids or um, who they were with their memories of what it was actually like to use glass at that time. Um, now what has happened is that people just think it's old. They can't tell whether it's from 1776, 1876, or they just know it's from before their lifetime. Um, so there's no real living memory that's, that's connecting it. Um, so we have used those spaces. The Victorian kitchen has become an exhibit prep space um, in order to be able to host um, these uh, 6,000 square foot uh, changing exhibits every year. Um, we really needed space in order to host, house the um, equipment and materials we need um, in order to do that. Um, and the um, Victorian dining room, again, um, neither of these were um, specific pieces. They were sort of esque, um, what, would have, what, could it, what it could have looked like. So we weren't preserving a specific um, person's dining room. Um, again, they were sort of what might have been. So um, because they weren't being really touchstones for the visitors in the living memory anymore, we uh, moved on to use that space for um, contemporary artists who can make a, a sort of relevant connection to um, people today. Thank That's you for great. the question. Sure. Um, and then we have one um, from one of our members, Susan, who wanted to know what typically is the percentage of items that are not on display but are in storage? Excellent question. Um, your average museum, and we are the same, has about 25% of its holdings on display and the rest are in storage. Um, so um, having these changing exhibits like this are a really great way to get some of those pieces that are in storage out on display. Um, for example, the image you see here, we've pulled out a lot of our Millville roses. Um, some of them, you know, we have some of our key ones always on display, but there's a lot we have that aren't on display. So it's great to be able to um, pull them out and uh, put them out there um, so that we get a chance to seed them. Um, we also do loan works to other museums, and that's another way that um, people can get to see um, what's in our collections. And like I said before, if any um, interested member of the public um, wants to set up an appointment to do research, we are happy to help um, provide access to those pieces that um, are, are hidden away. Um, and, and programs like this, again, thank you, Kelly and, and Marcy and you know the rest of the Wheaton team. Um, I'm sitting on so much amazing content here um, it's an embarrassment of riches, really, and it's wonderful that, um, you know, there's a whole institution here to help me um, share these stories with you and everybody. Um, so that's, you know, I, as they can tell you, I could sit here and talk for hours um, about this stuff. <laughs> um, so it's, it's really great that they're here to um, support um, getting these amazing um, stories out here, even though, again, only, you can only put so much on display and the museum fatigue is real. So um, you have to be careful and not overwhelm your audience. And then before we moved on, I just had kind of a follow-up question to that. Of, 
when you're planning for, you know, an exhibit like this and you're researching and pulling out objects, how much of that actually gets to be the final product? Is everything you pull, you know, in the beginning a guarantee right away or what's that process look like? Excellent question. Um, not necessarily. Um, when we do research on the collection, um, again, we are a glass collection and the biggest threat to our glass is handling. So we try not to handle it as much as possible. And that's why we have a database that holds pictures and in information about these pieces. So we'll research in the database. And then from that, you can actually see in the slide up here in the image on the right is, um, you know, some snapshots, a, a, you know, just sort of a, a outline of the script I had, snapshots of images um, so we could go find them in the storage area. And sometimes we get to the storage area and we find that something um, is maybe um, too dirty or has some conservation issues and it's not really ready for display right now. Um, sometimes we will work to create a mount that will function for the place where we want it to go and we just cannot figure, figure that out. Um, you know, other times we just, while we're searching for something else, we'll stumble upon something and be like, oh, wait a minute, that would be better. So absolutely, um, the old adage in uh, the museum world is um, an exhibit is never finished, it just get put up. So um, pretty much it's changing until that glass goes up. Um, so yes, that's a really good point. Some of the things you see today might not end up in the, in the final exhibit, depending on how things, um, go but again if there is a particular piece you're interested in seeing or knowing more about um, always call ahead um, and if possible you know you can make an appointment with us to do more research or, or to dive deeper into it um, as you can see here also on the left is an image of a floor plan um, that we worked out um, so again as, as another part of these exhibits is not just picking the artifacts but designing where they go um, you know, not just how, you know, how they fit in the case, but also how the cases that they are in um, and the vitrines and the platforms lay out in the space, um, the graphics that go along with it that hold, hold the text to, um, you know, interpret these pieces. Um, and so a lot of this design work is, yes, certain, certain parts of it is, are about aesthetics um, and how your eye flows and the color, but there's also a lot behind it that we want to make sure everyone um, has a comfortable experience with the museum. So, you know, what kind of typeface and size are we using? Is enough contrast so you can easily read it? Oftentimes our labels are behind glass, so we take that in consideration. Um, space between pedestals and platforms, make sure you have an opportunity to really uh, view the piece. Make sure there's enough space because, you know, we have all sorts of visitors from um, groups of 50 school children that we need space for them to walk through to um, folks that might be uh, using a walker or a wheelchair and um, need a little bit more space to be able to move through. So we want to make sure that, um, again, our visitors are um, comfortable um, because that's really going to prime folks to really be able to focus on the art and um, the artifacts. And that's really what we're here to share. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, that's an overview of the two exhibitions that we're having in the museum. Um, I really hope um, that uh, the uh, pandemic situation improves quickly and we can see you all in person here in the museum to see these exhibits. I'm so thrilled that you are all able to take some time out of your day to share it um, with me and uh, Kelly and Marcy and uh, to learn a little more about what these exhibits are about, get a little sneak peek. Um, at what we've got planned um, for when we are able to reopen. Um, so please um, connect back with our website to keep an eye on when this evolving situation um, and we will uh, post information as soon as we know. Um, again, uh, thank you so much for being here and thank, thank you to my Wheaton team for um, supporting this programming and I hope to be able to um, connect with you again soon. Hey, Kristen, thank you so much um, for being here with us today. Um, I have a couple um, quick questions. I know we um, have about, you know, six minutes left. Um, so some of our questions, you know, maybe we'll might do individually after the fact. Um, but I, I can speak a little bit to this question, too. Um, the question was, do we have to have any special training if you were interested in volunteering at the museum? 
Um, so I can speak to, you know, more general volunteer opportunities, but I'll give this question, you know, to you, Kristen, for the museum specific aspect. Yeah, um, well, I'd, we'd love to have you volunteer, please. That's amazing. Thank you so much for, um, you know, even bringing it up. Um, yes, there is some trainings, depending on how you want to volunteer. Um, again, and, you know, when we open up, we might have docent tours. And again, that would involve learning um, the tour, learning how to interact with an audience, um, you know, shadowing or existing docents until you feel comfortable to uh, give your own tour. Um, if you want to volunteer back in the collections area or the library area, again, we would um, just on a staff level give you training on the best handling practices um, on whether objects or um, archive pieces and then as well as training on you know our our systems of numbering or, or inventorying or um, what it is we might need help with but um, we would love to have volunteers that's really um, you know a, a museum like like the Museum of American Glass and a place like Wheaton Arts really um, the volunteers really do an incredible and an important job and um, Kelly does an awesome job uh, organizing them and has special meet and greets so you can get to know us a little more and figure out where you might like to volunteer so I will let Kelly tell you a little more about that. Great, great. Yeah, I'll, again, I'll have my contact information, you know, at the end of the presentation. So if anyone was interested in either the museum or just general volunteer opportunities, you can, you know, shoot me an email. Um, I saw another question here too, um, how we, you know, you can support Wheaton Arts. Um, Marcy just put a link in the chat that brings you to our, you know, support page. So you can find, you know, volunteer information as well as that donation information is there as well um, or just shoot me you know me or Rudy an email to talk you know more one-on-one -on -one. Um, you can do that as well and I know um, some people you know have to run so our next um, slide we're actually going to ask you a couple um, questions before we head out if you were interested you know in future programs like this um, Marcy's going to put up a quick poll so if you have a little bit of time to spare and could please you know check those boxes we'd love to get your thoughts on some future programs And then while everyone is doing the poll, I'd like to again thank Kristen so much for giving us this sneak peek kind of behind the scenes look at the museum exhibit so far and to Marcy for all of her technical help and getting us getting this presentation, you know, up and running and training us and getting it out there. So thank you both so, so much. And to all of our members and our guests today, thank you again so much for joining us, um, taking the time, you know, to spend with us even though we can't be physically together yet, and for your membership and your support of Wheaton Arts. Um, and again, thank you for taking that poll and giving us you know, some feedback. And we hope you all have a great day and look, really look forward to the day we can see you again. Well, thank you both. And I just wanted to add um, how energetic this is and, and the passion that, that comes through in both of you has been a real treat. Um, this is Marcy again. And uh, you can um, go back into the chat and, and look at those links that I share. But and most importantly, I think right now is the fact that there is a link to what we are offering again. In fact, I'm going to copy and paste it and put it, put it right now. What we are offering while we cannot let you um, come to the grounds or come onto the grounds, there is quite a bit that you can still enjoy about Wheaton Arts. Um, so don't forget to copy and paste those, or if you can download the chat then, or save the chat, um, that way you can go back to those links. And we will just um, wait another moment. Um, so that we can make sure that everybody gets a chance to answer those three questions. We're about halfway through and we'd really like everybody to just, um, uh, just it, it's just three questions, just um, give us an idea so that we can better serve you and, and um, meet you where you'd like to be. And I know there's there are plenty of things on the portal of the website, but there's a lot of excitement and a lot of exciting things coming up and um, I think you two showed that excitement. Um, Kelly, do you want to check the questions and are we we're all caught up to date there? I think so. Oh, I missed um, the best way to clean art glass. It was anonymous, so I'm not sure if that person's still here. 
Well, it's a good question. It looks like um, everyone's still here. Okay. Um, so in terms of cleaning glass, again, we're a museum, so we have a mandate to keep it in perpetuity. So we are going to be um, very cautious with it. Um, depending on the size, um, if it's a, a smaller piece um, without other materials on it, we have literally a, a Rubbermaid bin. So it's a soft plastic to kind of cushion it um, that we fill with uh, distilled water and maybe a drop of Dawn dish soap um, and use a soft cloth to um, clean it and then rinse it again with the distilled water and uh, let it air dry. Um, so that would be again a, a very conservative approach. Um, for artworks, you know, the, those little air canisters, um, again, depending on, on what other materials might be in there, are good for getting dust out of little crevices, little Q-tips to get in there um, would be the museum way. As far as, um, you know, your own glass, um, the idea of putting a tub in a sink just to protect it from breakage, um, a plastic tub is, is great. Um, you know, you can, if you need to make it shine, um, go ahead and use Windex. Um, or another kind of glass cleaner or vinegar or something like that to, um, again, but you just want to manage um, the other materials it's with. You want it to be, you, if it's got paper, you want to be, you know, more considerate of what the paper can take. Um, but that's, um, yeah, don't break it is really <laughs> how you clean it very carefully. But good question. Very good question. Okay. Well, well thank you. We can wrap it up now. And again, I'll, I'll give everybody um, five more seconds if they want to save the chat or um, we have about five people that could answer the polls if they get to it. And again, just thank you all so much um, for joining this pilot program. We hope you enjoyed this behind the scenes look. And, and again, we just we can't wait to see you all again. And, Get to show you the final product. <laughs> Absolutely. And thank everybody for their um, words of cheering us on. Yes. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and end the polling. And um, this way you will be able to see um, Kelly and Kristen's information. And I did put that in the chat. Um, so everybody should be able to find you now and oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great week. Bye now. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.